We never came home to a thank you or nothing. All he did was spit at us. Baby kill? It's all yours, a baby kill. Too many were treated like dirt. Make sure you're in civilian clothes because otherwise you're gonna deal with the wrath of God. Too many ridiculed. I would never say I was in Vietnam. I was ashamed to say I was in Vietnam. It was the dirty war. My fellow Americans. We learned that our politicians will openly lie to us. The initial attack on the destroyer Maddox on August 2nd was repeated today. We abandoned our allies. We lost the war. 65,000 from our first coast were sent to a war zone 9,000 miles from home. I was 20 years old, and I was scared as all hell. To fight in the jungles of Vietnam. I joined the service basically to serve my country, and I served it very proudly. Because some of us went in there, they never came out. If you think history's boring, you've had the wrong teacher. This is a First Coast News special presentation, sponsored by Duval Motor Company, proudly serving Northeast Florida since 1916. Voices of bravery honoring the veterans of Vietnam. Now, on board the USS Orlac, one of the most decorated warships in the United States Navy, here are the First Coast veterans who served in Vietnam. Standing with First Coast News anchors Jeannie Blaylock and Lewis Turner. Well, what an honor it is to stand here with our Vietnam veterans. And now we mark 50 years. Well, it's 50 years since the last U.S. combat soldier came home from Vietnam. So now we invite you to listen. And to learn. Which countries fought in the Vietnam War? Oh God, I have no idea. I have no comment on that one. <laughs> Do you know? No. <laughs> we're in deep trouble. We're in deep trouble. So we're standing in front of the Veterans Memorial Wall. And so did the United States at all fight on the ground in Vietnam? I don't believe they did. I do not believe they did at all. They came, they came, they didn't even come ashore. Stupid. That I, I went through what I did and they don't know anything about it. To see these people, Sorry, I don't even know their history. It's very upsetting. We begin now with one of the most dangerous jobs of the war. Ever heard of a tunnel rat? I hadn't, until I went to Vietnam back in 1993. I was a very young reporter then, and I will never forget what I learned. The trauma wasn't just above the ground. Viet Cong also fought underground. We're in Vietnam near the former Saigon in the tunnels of Cu Chi, tunnels they started digging in the 1940s. Down below, they gave birth, they sewed uniforms, and mapped out plans to kill us. So our tunnel rats, their mission, plant bombs and try to snuff out the enemy. And one American soldier said it's like going to somebody else's house and trying to find them in their own house. They know their way around, but you have no idea where they are. From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. I started out as a Marine Corps blunt, 0311. You thought it was easy? Oh, I said, this is going to, this, this is, this is my bag. No problem. Yeah, but that changed, huh? Real quick. Underground, the enemy, 6,000 Viet Cong, their soldiers, their babies, even their surgeons, 150 miles of tunnels on three levels. A lot of brothers went down there, but not too many came out. Charlie and two buddies, he says that's it. All the rest are dead from suicide back home or tunnels there. Tunnels hot as heck and too dark to see the snakes. 
What are your feelings when you're down there? Those are searches. Cause that's what you got in your skids. Yeah. Scared and cramped. Average Vietnamese, tiny, 100 pounds. Charlie back then, small for American men, but 20 pounds more than his enemy. So he crawls like this. I just listen. You can hear your blood going through your veins. You can hear your blood going through your veins? What did it sound like? Like swooshing with pressure. I'm trying to calm all that down. Do you try not to breathe heavy? Mm hmm. All you want to hear is nothing. Somehow, Charlie survived, but the trauma for these guys. Just this year, I met another tunnel rat in Jacksonville. Sam Nelson is 75 now. When I got dressed, I weighed 100 pounds. And they said, oh, yeah, he good. He was small. When I went into basic training, they looked at me and the guy said, yeah, you're gonna be a, you're gonna be a tunnel rat. And I thought they were joking. I didn't know what a tunnel rat was. Small enough for hell underground. And for the first time. My wife don't even know. He's opening up with details. Because some of us went in there, they never came out. Because you got bamboo sticks filled with um, human waste. And you get stuck with that. You get gangrene right away. I almost lost my feet. The flesh came off. Every time I pull off my sock, flesh came off. And the enemy? They cut a man's head off because he went to sleep on guard. You don't want to see nothing like that. You got to bust your heart out, especially a friend of yours. Did you see that? Yes, ma'am. But then, after all of that, Sam finally comes home, back to the United States. First thing I did, I kissed the ground. And a hero's welcome, right? Kill people. Oh my gosh, no. You kill people. You kill people. When I landed in California, uh, they were calling us baby killers. I don't know how they know it. Baby killers and everything. Can you even to this day understand why people spit on you and screamed at you when you came back from Vietnam? I don't know. I thought we were serving our country. We tried to be the best of the best. And then over time. I would never say I was in Vietnam. I was ashamed to say I was in Vietnam. And still now. And there's some stuff inside of me I probably would never tell you because it's so much pain. But now, 50 years later, still proud to wear his purple heart, still proud he served our country. But those tunnels kick up a bigger issue, a key reason we lost the war. Our approach was ignorant. Dr. Michael Butler, historian, professor, Flagler College. Between 1962 and 1973, we dropped eight million tons of bombs on Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. That was three times more tonnage than we dropped in all of World War II combined. But wipe out the tunnels and kill the enemy? No. The tunnels were constructed in a way that would protect those in the tunnels from the blast. The Vietnamese were experts at using the environment to their advantage in ways that we did not comprehend. From tunnels to jungles, we tried to destroy another enemy hiding spot. The dense jungle. So, enter the disaster of Agent Orange. Agent Orange used by the United States to deforest, defoliate, kill as much vegetation as possible to take away the ambush hiding spots of the Viet Cong. Soldiers sprayed it from riverboats and dropped it on forests from the sky, and no one could hide from it. Everybody's got a story. <clears throat> Tony Mann's raspy voice tells a story too, and likely will for the rest of his life. And they go down and clean up the, they check the esophagus, make sure there's no cancer, because I was a very, I was borderline cancer for the esophagus. So they burn off the cells, they send them in and find out what the status is. His two year exposure to Agent Orange has him making frequent trips to the VA. I had two minor strokes, 
uh, back in 2016. And they they said it was due to Asian orange because they cut me open. And uh, um, I have to go back to Minnesota every year for the rest of my life and have a procedure done. But before that, Tony's Vietnam story. I joined the service basically to serve my country. And I served it very proudly. He enlisted in the U.S. Army, knowing he'd be sent overseas, was assigned to the 199th Infantry Brigade, became a specialist handling artillery known as the Four Deuce, patrolling a perimeter around Saigon. We were the best that the, that, that the government ever had. Till this day, we're still the best that the government ever had. The minute that phone rings, everybody grabs their steel pot, their bulletproof vest, and runs out to the gun pit and sits there and waits for the coordinates. And that patrolling meant long marches through the jungle and the swamps, all while clouds of gun smoke and chemicals fell from the sky, exposing some three million U.S. troops. When you're in water, you're walking around with, you're, you're absorbing Asian orange. I have a friend of mine that, um, in Minnesota, uh, he was dying from Asian Orange big time. He was dumped on four times out in the field, literally. I mean, his heart was being eaten away. One of the consequences of the vast amounts of Agent Orange that were used is that now it constitutes a war crime. Of course, it wasn't just U.S. soldiers exposed to the chemical. Countless cases of cancer and extreme birth defects plagued the Vietnamese as well. Long-term impact. Exposure to Agent Orange has been cancer. It has been birth defects. It's been a variety of health-related ailments that only recently has the Veterans Administration acknowledged. Do I have friends that are still alive? Um, no, not so many. One that I know of. It's eaten at him. Three times in country, he says he had a gun in hand ready to commit suicide. First time is when I took somebody out. Second time was when a friend of mine got killed. The third time is when I lost five guys. Haunting memories he continues to live with and physical scars, constant medical treatment from a war he still has to fight internally. It changed my life yeah. for, for, for the rest of my life. My name is William Smith. I served in Vietnam, and you are watching the Voices of Bravery. Welcome back. So we have talked now about the physical wounds left behind by Agent Orange. Bad enough, but, but worse for too many. A knife to the soul, disrespect. We respect our World War II veterans. They annihilated the beast. Throughout the world, throngs of people hailed the end of the war in Europe. And no doubt, they deserved the big welcome home. But for our Vietnam vets. Well, they were just standing over there on the fence saying, baby killer, it's all yours, a baby killer. Major Craig Dunning, United States Army, served in Vietnam 1967 and the recipient of two Purple Hearts. I got shot in the back for the last time and busted my brain and skull. Finally, doctor said, you can leave the hospital, you can go home. And so outside, applause, right? Thank yous, right? And no. There was a fence on each side of where we walked to. And there was people on each side of it calling us baby killers and throwing eggs at us and tomatoes. And he wanted to yell back. Tell them go to hell. They weren't there, they don't know. They didn't fight. They didn't have leeches down their pants. That's what got me smoking. We used to have to take cigarettes and burn them off of us because you pull it off their things would still be in it. Your legs. Their things? Well, yeah, their things. Leech is creepy enough, but the disrespect, the true trauma. Uh, they made me ashamed when I got home. For decades, he never told anyone he was a Vietnam vet, and the shame ate him away. 
The words, the screams, stuck in his mind. Baby kill? It's all yours, a baby kill. All I can do is pray to God and please, please let me forget. But how did our Vietnam vets get branded with that? Oh, it was absolutely horrendous. 1968, My Lai Massacre. More than 500 Vietnamese slaughtered. Girls, old men, and babies. We're talking about shooting, we're talking about bayoneting, we're talking about bashing their skulls in. Our soldiers, Charlie Company, 11th Infantry Brigade. Why? The village considered a hotbed for communists. To the degree that this village was labeled a part of Pinkville. The photos seared into the minds of Americans back home. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. And with anti-war protesters. The label baby killers stuck. Despite the fact. Not all veterans were baby killers, period. But for Craig, the terrible treatment scarred him. And now, some 50 years later, he looks at his service in Vietnam. Do you feel like you accomplished something? Uh, not really. And so he's writing his story. Trying to show other people what we went through. And he's blunt. He blames the politicians. I can see them sitting in hell with the devil. He says they deserve the shame. I wish I could have relied on the politicians in Washington, D.C., sitting on their fat asses, making all the wrong decisions. Too many bright young people. They would be alive with their families where they should be instead of dead in a box in a country they knew nothing about fighting a war they do, didn't understand. May God hold him in his loving arms forever. Amen. No doubt many Vietnam veterans are bitter. Take the Gulf of Tonkin. They have a reason to be bitter because of all of the lies that surrounded the episode. I shall immediately request the Congress to pass a resolution. The Tonkin Resolution, monumental. Critics say it gave President Johnson blanket power to wage war. He later claimed that it was like grandma's nightshirt. It covered everything. For justification, LBJ told the nation the North Vietnamese attacked U.S. ships not once, but twice. August 2nd, attack on the USS Maddox. But another attack two days later? There's no evidence to indicate that it occurred. In fact, the evidence is overwhelming that it did not. And what about escalation? President Johnson said that it would not lead to escalation when, a year later, 185,000 additional troops had been sent to Vietnam. It was a lot. Oftentimes you'll hear Vietnam called the dirty war, and yet our servicemen, some 50 years later, will still tell you they went to serve our country. And what they endured, most of us can't fathom. Kids these days, oh yeah, they know all about warfare. Right? Wars are not like the games on TV. In Vietnam, when you get shot and you get killed, you're dead. Tony DeLeo, United States Army, then re-enlisted in the U.S. Marines, two and a half years, served in Vietnam. His buddy struck by mortar fire. I had to hold his intestines in. You know, he got blown up. And he can still see that all the time that I was trying to wrap him up with a poncho to keep his intestines in his body. I was 20 years old, and I was scared as all hell. And now, some 50 years later, he's still scared in his nightmares. I wake up with sweats, cold sweats. And why? Well, the details, yeah, they're disgusting. Tony knows that, but maybe it helps us to understand, to respect what our veterans endured in Vietnam. You go down a tunnel with a flashlight and a 45. That's it. 
and they'd set booby traps, snakes, two-step Charlies. If you get bit by this, this snake, by the time you did your second step, you're dead. And then maybe worst of all, after a battle, the bodies would be mutilated. So when the Americans came back to retrieve bodies. Because you never leave an American behind. Uh, some of the, their uh, sexual organs would be cut out. Some of the heads would be cut off, put in, on pogey sticks, bamboo sticks. Whatever they could do to desecrate a body, they would do it. But it wasn't just butchery. It was a strategy, a wicked strategy. They would cut off a man's Johnson, and they would put it in his mouth. And he would be wired to a tree. They would tie him up to a tree. We would find it. And that was a, to get our minds crazy, because that guy was in our squad or our platoon. And some of us knew him personally, and we want to go get them. And they use that to make us run, because we don't care no more. We just want to kill them, no matter what. A mad rush of revenge. And they would have an ambush set up. The sick plot worked. Ambush, even more American boys killed. Either he goes home to Nana, or I go home to Nana. I killed my first person in Vietnam. I never killed anyone before. I know exactly how many I killed. Do you wish you didn't? I wish I didn't. I wish I didn't go to Vietnam. And yes, the My Lai Massacre gave a bad, bad name to Vietnam soldiers. But Tony says, don't smear all the Vietnam vets. They have earned the respect and the support they don't often get. It's deny, deny, hope the vet goes away or dies. So why did we go to war? We got into this war due to a belief in the so-called domino theory. It was motivated by the fear that communists were out to control the globe. Click, 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 click. The dominoes would fall to the point that we would have to fight the communists in the United States. My name is Bob Henning. I served on USS Ticonderoga, aircraft carrier in Vietnam, and you're watching The Voices of Bravery. Well, do you recognize this? It is a POW bracelet. It seems everybody in my high school wore one of these. This one says Peter Schoffel, a Navy pilot in Jacksonville. Call sign Savage, pilot A4 Skyhawk, shot down 1967 and sent to living hell. You can't breathe because your, your chest is compressed during this process. The process to get our captured boys to talk, handcuffed and shackled. You have to realize that after a little bit of this, you have no support uh, from your own muscles. And so generally be on my side like that, maybe, and sweating so hard that I'd have a pool of sweat under my head and I'd lean over and suck it up. That is, lick up his own sweat to get some moisture in his mouth. Captain Schoffel, when we first met him back in 1993, he helped us understand the torture of our POWs in Hanoi. I came to Vietnam as a young reporter. And Pete, uh, I'm thinking about you. Here by the Hanoi Hilton, the torture chamber, the wicked prison for our POWs, like John McCain, locked in the same room as Peter Schoffel. Pete wrote these poems about his torture, tiny little words for, for such enormous emotion, and he hid them from the communists in his underwear. Here, twisted in a choking, knotted hell, you strove to save your broken pride, and failing, heard its never-ending knell, and mourned you had not died. And that hell for Pete, five and a half years. Two thousand and seven days. Now, Pete is 90 years old. His dog, Bonnie, his model A4, all bright spots, and even a little chuckle now about those poems. Pete made his own paper. Every day, they got two packs of cigarettes, he tells me. So you could get the, the pack, 
of this really cheap paper and soak it in water and, and so that the glue uh, is uh, dissolved and you had something to write on. And you remember, he hid the poems in his underwear. Why? Well, he says the North Vietnamese never wanted to see naked soldiers. We started out taking off our clothes to wash, you know, and they got very upset about that. <laughs> Pete was clever. He did manage to smuggle out those poems when he was released and... Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> that day, that day of freedom. A puzzling feeling. None of us were sure that it was really going to happen. But Pete was loaded onto a C-141. The airplane did roll out to the end of the runway and did take off. And still, we weren't sure, you know. Who knows what kind of nasty thing the, the Vietnamese were going to do. But then the pilot said, feet wet. Feet wet, the term for land to sea. And that was the moment everybody broke free and screamed and yelled and had this wonderful feeling. That was a, it was a great feeling. We're met by pretty American nurses. It was late at night, I mean 12.30 or something like that when we landed in Hawaii and we were met by this. Um, this great group of people who just wanted to say, Welcome home. It was just uh, one of the greatest feelings in the world, you know. And despite all that time locked in hell, 2,007 days. So I got to the, to, to fly the airplanes that were just wonderful to fly, and to take part in, in an effort that I thought was just. at Saigon's Tonsonut Airport, the last 2,500 departing American troops, and on the last plane, there was an official last man, Sergeant Major Max Bealty. I think it's a fitting ending to the job I had. When you're responsible for moving the people out of here, I think it's nice to know you're the last man out. I had to do a job. Now we're going to see some good folks trying hard to right a wrong. An appropriate homecoming this time. So come along with us on an honor flight. I wasn't spit on, but somebody spit in my direction. I was spit on. When I came home, I got spit on. We were told, don't wear your uniforms. You, you know, don't get on the plane with your uniform on. Even a nurse? Oh, yes. You're saving lives. Still Vietnam. I got off the plane. He was spit at. He was called a baby killer. He was everything you could possibly think of. There were no homecoming celebrations, ticker tape parades for many Vietnam veterans. Hell fighting in Vietnam. The war came to Saigon early in the morning of January 31st. Lorenzo Neely in the Tet Offensive. Which was a complete massacre. Too much killing, too much. Only to return home to a different battlefield. Mentally it got to me, so. Yeah, I am. <laughs> For Neely and the thousands of other Vietnam veterans across our first coast, the dark past can't be changed. But a group called First Coast Honor Flight is working to brighten the future for Vietnam veterans to alleviate the internal battle many keep fighting to this day. It's a day trip to D.C. Yeah, I felt great. A flight from Jacksonville where onlookers stop what they're doing to applaud. That was awesome. It's pretty awesome. A true ovation and welcome when arriving. Thank you for Thank you, buddy. Thank you for your service. Well, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Did you get that? Spending time touring D.C. For the Vietnam vets, it's not just a day, really, it's a lifetime for them. It's, it's recognizing their service that was never recognized. Don Simmons, the president of First Coast Honor Flight, and he says the most powerful part of the day in D.C. for him. They get to the wall and they all know people. And they stop there, you know, at their friend that they knew when they were 18, 19, 20 years old. So yeah, that's me. Neely took that trip and found his name in a book of veterans who served the tiniest of recognition that meant the world to him. Yeah. <laughs>
pretty cool. I didn't believe nobody knew it except for me. Yeah. <laughs> First Coast Honor Flight takes World War II, Korea, and Vietnam veterans free of charge on these trips, a trip they may not have taken otherwise. They're partnered with a volunteer guardian, camaraderie built in a long day of travel to return home to a night of celebration. I just wish there was a, a way that we could get all the veterans that, especially the Vietnam vets that never had anything. They deserve something like this. For Neely and veterans like him, perhaps just a small time of peace after a lifetime of war. It's beneficial for me <laughs> and it's going to be all right. You're watching Voices of Bravery, honoring the veterans of Vietnam. Sponsored by Duval Motor Company, proudly serving Northeast Florida since 1916. Welcome back to Voices of Bravery. A proper welcome home or just a welcome home at all never happened for her father. Jill Hubbs was here in Jacksonville as a teacher at Crown Point Elementary. So let me take you back to Vietnam, 1993. Such pride, then March 1968. Jill's father was flying an S-2. It disappears over Vinh, south of Hanoi. But then it starts. The evidence Jill's dad might not be dead. Pictures this time of prisoners tending a garden. This one apparently Jill's dad. So Jill's mom writes everybody. The Secretary of the Navy, the Ambassador to China, everybody for years. And Jill writes too. May of 1970, it says, Dear President Nixon, I have one small plea. This must sound crazy, but the way I wrote this is, I woke up crying about 10 o'clock at night on May 19, 1970. But in Hanoi, Jill's plan to just go out and ask, have you seen my father? He'd, he'd have three scars here, here, and here. It doesn't work. Because there are some that have names on them. And, uh... So here at Vietnam's military museum, she looks for his helmet or his dog tags, anything from the daddy who wrote his little sweetheart. But there is nothing. So now, decades later, Jill's dad would be 96. <laughs> but a little reunion with Jill. Is it 30 years? And turns out. He was my fishing buddy. She is still trying to solve the mystery of her dad. People say, you know, you need to give this up. You know, it's let it go. But my answer to that is you don't understand unless you've been there. I love my dad, and, you know, it's important to me to know what happened. So that man in the picture at the POW camp, did that turn out to be your dad? It could never be positively, you know, proven one way or the other. But her quest for proof, just tenacious. You've been to the White House. Twice now, yes. And she told them. I'd like some answers. I want an underwater search. Jill says our government is diving in the Gulf of Tonkin, but it is not enough. 1,000 remains identified since the war, but still 1,500 unaccounted for MIA. And something else we can't ignore. You know, I remember that. I've thought about that moment for so many years. And that moment takes us back to 1993 and our trip to Vietnam. Her sons, one killed, one MIA, missing in action. And I ask her to tell us more about her son. We get to know, describe. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> They're hard, the tears, but you're about to watch something for the first time. This picture Jill Hubbs has brought from Jacksonville to Vietnam. Please tell her that uh, my father is also missing from the Vietnam War. Uh, how old is he? He, he was 42, 42 yeah. years old. It is thought to be the first meeting ever between MIA families from opposite sides. 
Will you tell her that I would like to give her this picture of my father? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But that's not all. Now look at this. Two burned every day for her two sons. <laughs> but now she cries out for three. <laughs> it is still hard to watch. I felt her emotion so much when she, when you asked her about her sons. It was a moment I'll never forget, a, a moment of true understanding and forgiveness and peace. Jill believes in healing. She's gone back again to Vietnam, to the Gulf of Tonkin, the exact spot her dad was last known to be. I took a wreath that I had made with his picture that I had laminated. And no, she's not quitting. She's still pushing to find out about her dad. But in that boat, for a few minutes, back in Vietnam. I said a little prayer, and I just put it in the water and let it go. A lot of emotion from Jill and the Vietnamese mother who lost her sons. Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, in Vietnam, they don't call it the Vietnam War. They call it the American War. An estimated 3.8 million of their own killed. I mean, they were dismissed as people that wore pajamas and fought in sandals. And Dr. Butler says a culture we did not understand to our own demise. After the war, we had been defeated by what Lyndon Johnson had once called a raggedy ass fourth rate country. My name is Macy George. I served in Vietnam, and you are watching Voices of Bravery. The Draft Lottery, a live report on tonight's picking of the birth dates for the draft. The draft was needed because we had to have the manpower to put on the ground to stop the spread of communism in Vietnam. We simply didn't have it. Dr. Mike Butler is an expert on the war in Vietnam, explains that while the draft was a lottery, it wasn't equitable. If you were drafted, you didn't get to choose which branch you joined or what your assignment was. So most of those who were drafted were sent to infantry. They were the ones on the front lines who saw the most serious of the combat action. That was it, that's the grunt life, being out in the field, being in the jungle. That was, you know, just living every day, trying to stay alive. 2.2 million men were drafted to fight in Vietnam, and the draftees accounted for one third of the American combat deaths. Jim considers himself extremely lucky to have avoided that statistic. Like I say, I was lucky that I only got hit once. Shot in the leg, a Purple Heart recipient. it become the effing war? Tet Offensive, 1968. It was the major turning point in the war. The enemy cannot win now in Vietnam. Up to this point, our politicians had told us that the Vietnamese communists were almost defeated. The Tet Holiday in Vietnam, a ceasefire, but a surprise attack by the communists lay waste to 100 cities and villages in South Vietnam. However, militarily, it was a disaster for the communists. We kicked their butt. Major General Richard Belton. He was in Tet, in the Central Highlands. We killed 139 that one day. We lost one soldier. Estimates vary, but overall, North Vietnamese communists killed 40,000 plus. US troops killed 1,100. Yet the American public was told. Well, they were told, what? We got attacked? Oh, shock. We got attacked in a hundred and some places? How'd that happen? Hell no, we woke up. Even more fuel for the anti-war protests. Did we lose the war? We abandoned our allies. We lost the war. Most historians agree. We absolutely lost the war. 
The U.S. objective, save the South from the Communist North. 50 years ago, January 27, 1973, the Paris Peace Accords. We will guarantee to continue generous funding of South Vietnam. But we did not. We broke a lot of promises. The U.S. withdrew support. Two years later, the fall of Saigon. South Vietnam surrendered to the North, the Communists. My name is Rick Morris. I served in Vietnam War, 1969 to 1971, and you are watching Voices of Bravery. Thank you so much for watching Voices of Bravery, honoring the veterans of Vietnam. And Lou, I know there's one thing still that we want to tell our Vietnam vets. Service. And welcome home. To our Vietnam veterans, as a command master chief and a Gulf War veteran, I understand the significance of war. The Vietnam War proved to be the greatest challenge to American idealism since the Civil War. Upon return from war, fellow Americans spat on these veterans and criticized their good name. Today at airports across America, when people cheer our returning troops, it is in part because they remember our Vietnam veterans that today's war fighters are getting the due respect they deserve. Thank you for your service. Oh, thank you. Thank you for saying that. To those who return but still are haunted by the nightmares of war, those who suffer from PTSD, Agent Orange, and are still fighting the last battle, steaming from the jungles in Vietnam to here at home, where the cruelest aspect of the war was the treatment of the returning soldiers. I know for many, it still seems like yesterday. Yet today, thanks to you, all veterans know that their sacrifices are appreciated. Their courage is honored. I think by now most Americans recognize that we got it wrong and are now resolved never to let it happen again. I thank you for your valiant fighting spirit, your perseverance, your resolute courage, and your selfless devotion to duty. You are our heroes. I salute you. We salute you. The watch stands relieved. We, we have the watch. Welcome home, warriors. This has been a First Coast News special presentation. Sponsored by Duval Motor Company. Proudly serving Northeast Florida since 1916. Voices of bravery, honoring the veterans of Vietnam. If you know a Vietnam veteran who has never welcomed home, Voices of Bravery is streaming now on Roku and Fire TV on First Coast News Plus. First Coast News, on your side.